thank you for having me back again. Um, you know, I, this is my, probably my, I think my second or third time being up here in White Bear Lake uh, this year alone. And so I'm excited to be back. Uh, it's great to see the interest in, you know, lawns and in turf grasses and in just in water conservation, all the activities that Nick had mentioned a second ago uh, that y'all are involved with here in this area uh, in the watershed uh, district here. Um, and if you weren't at the last talk, I'm a turf grass scientist from the University of Minnesota down at the St. Paul campus. And um, I do primarily a lot of research and outreach education or extension, um, primarily with folks like you and other consumers in how to manage their lawns better. I primarily specialize in water conservation and how you can uh, do and implement better practices such as mowing or fertilization um, or even upgrading a sprinkler system uh, to reduce your water usage but still keep your lawn at a nice healthy quality. Uh, but tonight we're going to focus mainly on just choosing the right grass uh, for your lawn or how to, and how to care for it properly. And we'll spend a, quite a bit of time talking about uh, the fine fescues and the tall fescue, those fescues that you may have heard of uh, that are very low maintenance and require very little inputs compared to bluegrass. So when you think of lawns, you know, this is something that I think of. This is a photo uh, that kind of represents what I think of when somebody says the word turf grasses or lawns. Um, the reason why is because at a, our research farm, uh, both in Minnesota, but also where I just came from at, at Arkansas, as you can tell, uh, <laughs> this is what I would see all the time, is people would come out when they're dri driving past our farm and they'd start touching our grass. It didn't matter if it was tall or if it was a putting green height or a fairway or if it was really big and they just wanted to run their fingers through it like a pasture or something. Uh, they always want to touch the grass. If you came out to the, how many of you were at the state fair this year? Did any of y'all come by our exhibit with the little grasses in the houses and the neighborhoods? Some of y'all look familiar. A lot of people would just come and touch those. Little kids would come up and touch them and their parents would get all embarrassed but before you knew it, the parents were touching the grasses as well. Uh, in the little houses and everything. People love lawns. People, there's a lot of scrutiny out there in terms of lawns in the landscape. You know, people wanting to, you know, th tear them out because they require so many inputs and maintenance, but that's an absolute myth in and of itself. It's improper management practices that lead to more maintenance being required. But really people, you know, they love being outside. They love the look and feel of a lawn, you know, what it does for our property values. And you can go ahead and skip to the next slide. Uh, a lot of the benefits that turf grasses provide, you know, these all are things that contribute to this area here in this watershed district. All the environmental benefits, we talk about, you know, being sustainable, being more environmentally friendly. You know, if you don't have any ground cover there or, or perennial ground cover like grass, uh, then you're subject to having like soil being lost through erosion. Through erosion. And, and if you think about all the banks along the watershed, along the, the lakes and the rivers and the streams, and uh, roadsides and other places, you know, it's important to have a living ground cover there. Uh, reducing the dust pollution, reducing glare, uh, cooling our environment by reducing the amount of heat uh, that's being reflected, capturing carbon from the air. There's a lot of issues going on right now with, with climate change and concerns about global warming. Uh, lawns and perennial ground covers such as turf grasses are excellent at, at capturing carbon. Uh, reducing noise, reducing glare as well. Of course, there's recreational benefits as well. You know, it's a lot easier to go outside and just lay on the lawn or walk on the lawn as opposed to if you're just walking on concrete all day. How many of you all have gone to like a, you know, an outdoor mall, like a strip mall or, you know, out inside a mall perhaps? I don't know if there's malls still around today. It seems like a lot of people do their shopping online. But, you know, if you're just walking outside for a long period of time on concrete, you might, I don't know about you, but my feet kind of get tired. But I could walk all day. That's what I did as a graduate student. I just walked all day outside in the grass. It, it, four, five years of, of PhD program, and all I did was walk around in the grass. But, uh, but it felt great. It felt great. It was a soft surface. Uh, it was you know fun to see. Um, really nice to to, to be on. Uh, it, it provides a social space for us. Uh, and I have a pretty cool photo to kind of demonstrate that uh, here in a second. And then of course the obvious one is. Uh, um, once it pops up here, is uh, aesthetic benefits. You know, lawns look great. You know, we, we have blue skies and we have green lawns. Um, just that contrast uh, mixed in with our other plants and, and buildings in the neighborhood, you know, really adds a, 
a good pop and vibe to our communities. There's been studies that I've looked at, you know, as I mentioned earlier, increased property values in the neighborhood because of our lawns and the turf grasses that we have planted there. Um, there's also been studies, believe it or not, that have looked at and suggested that people who, you know, work in businesses in large urban environments, especially if you get closer into the cities, you know, they actually have better attitudes at work. So folks that have or patients in like nursing homes or rehabilitation centers or in hospitals, you know, just having a green space, you know, at that hospital or maybe even at a school building uh, uh, for children and for, for teachers, you know, having some type of green ground cover there for, for recreation or just for leisure uh, can contribute to improved mental health and better attitudes in the workplace. <clears throat> So this is a photo. Uh, this is not here in White Bear Lake. This is not here in, in Minnesota or in America itself. Does anybody know where this is at? It's Europe. It's Europe. It is Europe. This is the Plaza Mayor in Spain. Excellent guess. Uh, and this is what it looks like you know, on a daily basis. Uh, it's kind of like, I guess, the Grand Central Station there. Uh, just coming and going, a big marketplace. Uh, what don't you see there? Grass. You don't see any grass there. Uh, but what happened one time was, this is a couple years ago, a landscape architect came in and he saw that and he just decided, him and his crew, to, they did this overnight. They just laid out you know, a bunch of sod and I think they left it there for about a week or two. But look what happened. You know, all that hustle and bustle of the day, people took, they talk about taking time to stop and smell the roses. Well, they took the time to stop and lay on the grass. Uh, and recreate. Just again, just emphasizing that social harmony. You know, a lot of people think the solution to sustainability, the solution to water conservation and protecting our watersheds is to get rid of the lawn. No, that is the complete opposite. Um, and it's important that we keep our lawns, uh, you know, in our, in our communities and maintain those turf grasses better. So this is what a lot of people think they want their lawn, their, their lawn should look like, and I do not disagree with this at all. It's really hard. It requires a lot of inputs, in this case, with the other plants. And another thing is, too, is, is people, when they talk to me or my colleagues or faculty members, other turf grass scientists, they think that we're trying to just promote, you know, turf grasses and just monocultures. I'm here to tell you that's completely false. Uh, you know, we love working with the bee lab group. There's a lot of folks that we talked to at the state fair were interested in these bee labs or bee lawns or, or pollinator lawns. Um, as you can see here, you know, there's not any clover in the lawn, but they have tons of ground covers and, and ornamental plants with some trees and shrubs. You know, diversify, increase the, the, eco, the biodiversity in your, in your ecosystem in that small little microclimate in your lawn. You know, that's an excellent thing to do. Uh, uh, but in terms of what I focus on and, and what, you know, we're trying to, trying to keep people to, to realize is you should still maintain that ground cover, that lawn, uh, in your environment. And go, yeah, go ahead and incorporate some pollinator plants. You know, we'd like our lawn to look like that, but unfortunately it always, it's usually looks like this, or maybe our neighbor's lawn looks like this, or other lawns in our community or in our area. And a lot of people think, oh, it's time to you know, add more fertilizer, it's time to, to add more water, but you know, how do we know that, that that's necessarily a water issue or a uh, fertilizer issue? It could be a shade issue, it could be a compaction issue, it could be something going on underneath the soil. And people see this and they think it's just a big uh, chunk of time and labor required. And really, if we had stepped back and looked at maybe what caused the problem in the first place and gotten ahead of it uh, first for maybe choosing a more lower input variety or species of turf grasses, then that lawn would be similar to what we saw in the previous photo as well. And so as we mentioned earlier, you know, there's a lot of scrutiny with lawns. Um, you know, increases in urbanization means there's a lot of competition going around for water. Uh, it's important to also think about, you know, water is not just wasted on the lawn. Um, I can't see, you know, you brushing your teeth at night in the morning uh, and see if you run on the sink. Or I can't see if you run uh, uh, the faucet in the bathroom. I can't see if you run on the sink when you're washing your dishes or if you just wash them with a, with a, with a you know, full sink of water. Uh, but I can see if you're running your irrigation system uh, in the rain um, or right after it rain. I can see even if it's not raining, if you're running it too long where it's running off into the street or off into the sidewalk. Uh, a lot of people think, as we've mentioned already tonight, that the answer to that is to take out the lawn entirely and put in plastic grass. There's programs in California that have offered to provide a rebate for your lawn. A certain square footage of your lawn, they give you money or they'll come in and they'll put plastic grass in. Uh, 
that it actually hasn't worked out too well uh, for them um, because of that. I don't know. I put in some pictures, but they may not work right. You can keep on. There you go. Uh, this is, but this is not just there in California either. Uh, we have an example here in, in uh, the Twin Cities. This is from a couple years ago. This wasn't a rebate program. This is just a homeowner. I have no clue who this man is, but uh, he just lives there in the cities, and he got tired of of managing his lawn. He thought it required too much input and too much maintenance, maybe too many, much fertilizers or mowing or watering. And so what he did was he put in the plastic grass. He put in the artificial turf. And I've seen this sold, you know, at, at you know, just box stores. You can go and buy it by square footage and, you know, probably put it in yourself. But you know what happened to this man's lawn or this man's house, his property? He just took out all those benefits we just talked about five minutes ago. He doesn't have any of those benefits that we talked about uh, in terms of the aesthetic and the environmental and the recreational. He may have some recreation, but to tell the truth, synthetic turf gets really hot. It does not cool down. It actually is hotter than natural grass surface. So even though it may be something to play on, he's not going to be out there for very long. Um, but again, this is something that people will do uh, as, as, a, as a response to trying to reduce their water usage and reduce their living turf grass area. Uh, and of course, we see this all t too often as well. You know, miss poor irrigation timing, um, and just this, these are two photos that kind of demonstrate, you know, the, that the drive against turf grass in the landscape, the drive against lawns. You know, they require too much water. And when people, I hear people say, "Well, I drive to work, and the McDonald's is always watering, or my apartment community is always watering in the rain, or right after a rain." As well, it doesn't even have to be raining, and we still see turf grasses getting the blame. Uh, people think, well, my Kentucky bluegrass, it needs to be watered every day, or I'm on an odd, even watering system, so that means I need to water every odd day. Well, if you think about that, that means that you're watering 15 out of 30 days a month, and that is a completely wrong thing to do in terms of a plant health perspective um, and also a cost perspective as well. And again, just another photo emphasizing that. I was actually talking to somebody uh, this morning I was sitting in on a workshop down at Toro headquarters today, and, and he was telling me about this lawsuit uh, out in New Jersey. There was a scenario just like this, and an elderly lady was just walking around in the community, and she slipped because uh, the sidewalk was wet or something was wet. And, I mean, she, she took it to court. She won a big lawsuit, and uh, the property and the irrigation manager and everybody that was involved in the design and and workings of that system pretty much had to, had to pay up. Again, but that's not the lawn's fault. That's not the turf grass's fault. But people see that and think the solution is to get rid of the lawn um, or to, you know, just um, instead of fixing, you know, the management itself. And so what we're talking about tonight is, is an aspect of management uh, such as turf, choosing the right turf grass. And so why is water conservation important? Um, you can just skip through to keep going one, one more. So these uh, six things here, or five things here on the board, you know, all things that we just kind of summed up in the first 10 minutes of this talk. You know, it's important to be sustainable environmentally. Uh, you know, water is a precious resource. Nick and his team and, and Connie and White Bear Lake here have done an excellent, uh, you know, efforts in terms of trying to get people to realize how important and how uh, precious water is. You know, we live in the land of of 10,000 lakes, according to our license plate, uh, but you know that doesn't mean that water is is just you know uh, unlimited. There's also, as you think about Minnesota and as population growth as a whole, uh, there's an increasing demand uh, in terms of urbanization, but the supply is not increasing at all. Of course, there's a cost perspective. You know, why should we save water? Well, so that we save money. We could use money for other uh, costs that that we pay and expenses that we have but also overall plant health as well. There's a lot more consequences to overwatering than there are for underwatering. Um, and I've talked about that in my previous uh, uh, time with you here. And Nick can mention that the, it is on the YouTube channel if you want to go back and listen to that later this week. And so let's talk about turf grass water conservation. Well, it really requires a proper knowledge of best management practices. Um, and there's three main categories that, that you know, I kind of focus on the, the one that's underlined is what we're going to talk about tonight, and that's choosing the right turf grass. Now, I handed out, uh, I provided a handout for you 
And we won't talk about every single species on there tonight. Um, we'll talk about uh, a few of them though. And I also brought three turf grass species with me up here. Uh, they're up here on this table. I'll move them back there. Um, you know, and you can come up and ask me questions about them. But what I wanted you to see is that they all look pretty similar um, in terms of, you know, uh, outside of the fine fescue, the tall fescue and the Kentucky bluegrass look pretty similar. You probably can't tell which one is which from where you're sitting uh, between those two. But a lot of people that, that haven't seen fine fescue, so they maybe you've never seen tall fescue, but those are two varieties that are very uh, lower maintenance or require less inputs than traditionally used Kentucky bluegrass. But of course, there's other things as well. Uh, you know, the amount of mowing that we have to do or how frequent that we mow, you know, can also impact the water requirements. Uh, fertilizer practices, you know, cultivation such as aerification practices, uh, any type of pest management. If we're trying to control, let's say, weeds or diseases or insects and we don't read the label, you know, we can uh, cause, you know, more injury to occur that may require some more water for the turf to heal or to recover. And then also irrigation practices. Um, which is what we talked about earlier this year. One thing to keep in mind though, that you know, it's not just doing one of these things. So it's not even just doing maybe you know, two of these things. There's multiple things involved in terms of just thinking about water conservation. And the thing I always like to remind people is that there's no silver bullet to, uh, you know, it's not enough for you to just come tonight and learn about low impact turf grasses. You know, also still sticking to our management practices. Also still making sure our sprinkler systems are you know, at their optimum efficiency are gonna go a long way. Uh, to you know, using these lower input varieties and, and species. So the water requirements, they vary among turf grass species and varieties. So even though I have three grasses here that look very similar right now, I've been growing those you know, most of the year in my greenhouse and I'm able to love and care for them, but if we were to have these out in a field or out in the house, stuff where we're not able to like, keep an eye on them every day in a greenhouse, uh, you know, you'll start to see some separation where you know, our bluegrasses are gonna require a little bit more water than our fescues. Our bluegrass is gonna require a little bit more mowing, a little bit more fertilizer than our tall fescue and our fine fescues. And so, you know, but even within those species themselves, uh, there are drought resistant varieties or cultivars. And those are the names that you see on the back of a seed bag. And we'll look at those later tonight. Um, you know, turf grasses, if you look at these grasses here, um, I'll just pull these two over here, for instance. <clears throat> So I'll kind of step up under here so y'all can see. Feel free to move closer to the center if you need to. So you can see here, this is tall fescue and this is fine fescue. You know, I've had a pretty similar height right now, but even then you can just see how thin leaved and, and fine textured fine fescue is compared to tall fescue. Even though these are both uh, pretty similar in their water requirements and in their drought tolerance, you know, even in these characteristics themselves uh, from their leaf characteristics, uh, influence the amount of water that's required. And so, and this other one is Kentucky bluegrass, which is, you know, even though it looks similar to tall fescue, you know, it also has characteristics, uh, not only on the leaf, but also below ground as well, uh, through the root system, uh, that influence the amount of water that's required. So those are things to think about when you're trying to choose the right grass for your lawn. Um, but also, we have to also keep in mind, you know, thinking about water, you know, is it drought? This year, last year, probably not. We've had so much rain. I think we're about to break this yearly record uh, if it starts raining again this week or next week. Um, we're really close to the, to the annual record, I think, in terms of rainfall. So there may be something else going on, but a lot of folks may not be aware. And so they think, I need to turn on my sprinkler system because I maybe have a little brown. Well, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a shade issue. Maybe it's a fertility issue. Maybe it's my soil is compacted. Uh, maybe I'm mowing too low or I'm mowing too frequently. So there's a whole host of other issues it could be that aren't related to water at all. So when we think about our grasses, you know, what type of grass uh, should I have in my lawn? Well, up here in Minnesota, as you can see on the map, I have us highlighted there by the star. We're in what's called the cool season uh, region of the, of the United States. And then the middle part where I just came from in Northwest Arkansas is in the transition zone. And then we have the warm season in the, in the south. So we divide our grasses up into, into these three main regions and they're kind of been subdivided a little bit further uh, into uh, more uh, smaller regions as well. And so we are in the cool, humid um, or semi-cool, humid zone and that's where we have a lot of our uh, cool season grasses. So our blue grasses, our fescues, 
um, our bent grasses, our fine fescues. I think on the screen there it says finely fescues. And then also our rye grasses as well. All four of those species, or five of those species, are cool season grasses. Um, we don't have, you know, there are some lawns, there are some places I see some Bermuda grass or some zoysia grass, uh, but those are warm season grasses. Hopefully you're not trying to manage those for your lawn. It's more than likely that you probably have a, some rye grass or bluegrass in your lawn, um, but you may also have some fescue sprinkled in there, or you may see some properties here in the, the watershed district uh, um, with those fescues there as well. And so what are cool season grasses? How do they grow? What is their life cycle? Uh, the ones that we'll talk about tonight are all cool season grasses, our blue grasses, our fescues, our rye grasses. Uh, you know, this is how, this is their growth habit. I think there's a life cycle chart similar to this on the back side of your paper there uh, that you have with you. So right now, you know, we are in that fall period. I think the vernal equinox was yesterday, a couple of days ago. I have a weather app on my phone and it has this sunlight calendar. And I think it estimated we're going to have 12 minutes, 12 hours and two minutes of sunlight today. Uh, and I was like, wow, that's really close to, you know, because if you think about this, 24 hours in a day, you know, we're about half and half with 12 hours and two minutes. You know, we're right in that fall period uh, for sure. But right now, you know, these grasses, they're loving, these cool season grasses are loving uh, these low temperatures, you know, getting up to no more than, you know, about 70 or 75 during the day. And even then, it's only that, you know, temperature for maybe 30 minutes or so. But uh, during that summertime, we start to see those drought stress symptoms, you know, we really should scale back on our management. Uh, we don't need to mow as often. We actually need to mow higher. We don't need to be putting out fertilizer at that time. We'll put out fertilizer in the spring and in the fall. Uh, and so this is uh, these periods of active growth in terms of root growth and shoot growth, above ground and below ground growth, uh, doing those things in the spring and in the fall is best for those. So I talked about um, some grasses from Minnesota. So these, fe these species, so we have uh, tall fescue, um, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and fine fescues. And these are the ones that I have underlined here. There are two other ones there on the list, rough bluegrass and supina bluegrass. Uh, those are available here in this area. Um, they're kind of hard to find. You just need to call around, but also the seed may be a little bit expensive, and they really don't do well unless they're in a poorly drained area. They're a good grass if you have like just, you know, shade and uh, we're not shade, uh, if you have just low-lying areas that, um, you know, don't drain very well, it's just constantly wet, um, it may be affected by shade a little bit, you know, if you get a few hours of sunlight, it'll be fine, um, but otherwise, the main ones that we're going to talk about and that you should focus on uh, for, for, you know, figuring out which grasses you need are tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and fine fescues. You can see that with the arrows and also on your handout, you know, tall fescue and both Fine fescues are very drought and shade tolerant as well. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're shade intolerant. They do well in the sun. They just like, but they also do well uh, in the shade. Kentucky bluegrass, burning ryegrass, they do not do well uh, in the shade. But those are the species. Now it's important to also, you know, when we think about the species, to look at the research and look at, you know, the back of our seed bags and the varieties that are in those and choose drought resistant. Um, or improve varieties. And so one way that you can do that is you can go online on the internet and look up the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program, or NTEP. It's ntep.org, N-T-E-P.org. And so this is what it looks like when you enter the website. And I will, I will give you a warning, it is kind of outdated. Uh, at the University of Minnesota, our program, one of our faculty members is actually working with the computer science program. and to update this website to make it more user friendly. Eventually, you know, maybe in three to five years, we're going to have an app created where you could just literally go outside at your lawn and open this NTEP app and put in like different inputs, like I have partial shade or I have irrigation or I like to mow at three inches. And put all, just like if you were shopping like for something online, like clothes, and you put in, you know, what color you want, you're, you're, you're buying a new shirt, you want it, you put in an input that says, I want, long sleeve, I want a blue shirt, I want it to be gingham pattern, and I, I want it to be this size uh, and, you know, this brand. You know, just different inputs that you could think of only for your grass. And so that's a few years down the road from now, but that's hopefully the end, that's the end goal of this whole project. But right now, this is what the website looks like in terms of the database. So you would go online and you would click 
uh, there at, at Minnesota or even Wisconsin. Uh, most land-grant schools, most universities like Minnesota, which is a land-grant institution that has a turf grass science program, um, will have some type of NTEP trial to them. Now, I can't say that all of them have a drought trial, but they will have some type of rating trial that will provide you know, the overall performance of a, of a variety. So a variety is just like, just like um, basically an improved, uh, you know, developed uh, or, or cultivar is developed through breeding efforts that have improved traits like drought tolerance or shade tolerance or heat tolerance, uh, disease resistance. <laughs> Um, and those are listed there on the website. So this is an example of a NTEP trial in Texas at Texas A&M. Uh, this is what it looks like. I talked about it earlier. I just walk around in the grass all summer. Uh, you know, we go around as turf grass scientists and we rate each of these varieties. So these may all be Bermuda grasses right here. These are all different varieties uh, that breeders and seed, seed producers have, have submitted to be researched in these trials, and most of these trials last about three to five years, um, and just, you know, they, we rate them throughout the summer and, and test them for quality, for, you know, wear tolerance, traffic tolerance, drought tolerance, uh, disease resistance, it just depends on the trial itself and what's going on at that location. But when you was to go online and click on it and click on the data, if you was to find a trial, let's say we were looking at a trial uh, for, this is on a creeping bank grass, so a putting green turf. Uh, for a disease called dolly spot. So if a golf course superintendent was sitting there and they wanted to see which bent grasses had good disease resistance, dolly spot resistance, they could go online and get this data. This is exactly what it looks like. And so basically on the left, you have the column or the co of varieties or cultivars. Uh, the ones that are in parentheses or they just have a bunch of letters and numbers, those are experimental varieties. And so if you were to go online and you see a bunch of those, uh, that's a good indicator that those aren't actually commercially available yet. So they're still, they're still being tested and evaluated. But on the right-hand column, uh, basically what it's telling you, if you're really interested in it, is you know, which ones performed well and which ones did not. Now, these are grouped into different uh, locations. So in the middle columns, you, know, you have AR1, that stands for Arkansas, IN stands for Indiana, and all the other state abbreviations there. But then you use the data in the left hand, in the right hand column, which is your, statistic, your statistics, or the means of all those of all those varieties across the different locations. And at the bottom, you have something called an LSD value. I promise not to get too, uh, you know, nerdy here. But basically, you can use that number, that LSD value, and you can basically subtract it. So 8.4 is our highest number there, which one? And that's just basically a quality score on a scale of one to nine one being poor and nine being really good, uh, the best. And um, so you see within those first, you know, let's say 10 cultivars there, those are all, uh, you know, similar. So you'd want to pick one of those 10 if you were looking for something that was, you know, less resistant, or very resistant to dollar spot. So, but they have data like this for, for drought. They have data like this for just general quality as well uh, on that website. So if you were to decide that you wanted to, you know, pick a more drought tolerant variety of Kentucky bluegrass, or if you wanted to switch over to tall fescue. Um, I don't, I'm not aware of any fine fescue trials at the moment in the NTAP database, um, but there are certainly tall fescue and Kentucky bluegrass trials as well uh, that have been going on for years uh, that's in there. So. Um, there's other organizations as well that list varieties and, and cultivars that have been identified as, as being drought tolerant or lower input. Um, the Alliance for Low Input Sustainable Turf, A list. Uh, turf.org, it's a-listturf.org. Uh, the Turfgrass Water Conservation Alliance, tgwca.org. Uh, I've done a lot of work with them. They primarily do water. Uh, A-list does water, fertilizers, mowing, and other inputs. And then Low Input Turf is a local group here between uh, the University of, uh, of Minnesota and I think four or five other uh, regional universities and partners uh, to look at uh, you know, how much mowing, how much inputs are required in terms of water, fertilizers, and so forth. Um, this is an example of, so from the TWCA in terms of, you know, some of the research that they've done through their testing protocol um, is, you know, if you go to the store, I was in a Lowe's in South St. Paul. And I just, I always like to go in, even though I don't own my home, I rent my house right now. I'm not able to make any changes or anything significantly, like reseeding the lawn. 
Well, I actually go and look and see what's on the shelf from time to time. And I was surprised to see this uh, when I stepped inside this Lowe's. Um, I knew I'd done some work with them. And basically, you know, after these varieties have been tested, you know, they'll hopefully make it their way to you guys to be available there on the shelf. And lo and behold, I picked up this bag of perennial ryegrass. It said smart seed. It said something about saving water. And I was like, huh, because sometimes, you know, you see a lot of snake oil stuff on the shelf. And I turned the bag around. And at the bottom there, you can't really see it, but it has the varieties listed. There's three varieties, and those are all varieties that have done well. Uh, cultivars are varieties of perennial ryegrass that have shown improved drought tolerance or improved drought resistance compared to maybe older varieties and older cultivars of, of perennial ryegrass. And I know from that label being on that bag, that TWCA label, they've been you know, heavily researched uh, through those testing protocols for their, for their water requirement. And this is just an example from the Low Input Turf website. Uh, you can go online. Uh, again, this is coming straight out of our university just down the road here, uh, talking about you know, these fine fescues that, that you've heard so much about and we'll you know, end the night talking about today. Uh, this is just an example of kind of what they look like uh, you know, when they're not sitting there in a pot on the table. Um, very, very nice, very calm look to them. Um, these are what you may have heard as the low mow or no mow grasses. That doesn't mean you can't know them. Uh, we actually have some at our research farm that are being mowed as, at a putting green height, uh, looking at how low can you mow them. That's about an eighth of an inch. Um, we have some that's you know, being mowed at about a half an inch. So um, We have some that's not being mowed at all, and we're letting the seed heads develop. So it really is just you know, your preference, a user preference. Um, but it, provi it provides that you know, meadowy look, that pastoral look to them. Uh, it's a very nice uh, you know, feature and also doesn't need to be mowed or watered or fertilized very often, if at all. Uh, tall fescue is there. Um, again, we had, some, we had an issue here on the, on the left photo with you know, shade in that one spot. And so they just basically reseeded this entire area where it has you know, shade under that tree throughout the day. Um, but then sun in the areas, and you can see you know, it looks good in both sun and in shade. And then we see fine fescues again on the two photos on the on the right, uh, I'm standing on top of the fine fescue that's in that corridor on the top photo. This is just me standing on top of that no mow or low mow grass. Um, again, this is in an area on campus that's between a bunch of buildings, not much sunlight throughout the day. This is kind of goes down into a bank, um, so it doesn't get mowed a lot. Um, it doesn't get mowed at all, actually, uh, except for maybe one time a year, um, and doesn't get fertilized or watered at all uh, outside of the, the rain that falls. This is also one thing that we think about in terms of fine fescues or low input turf grasses. You know, blue grasses and, and tall fescues, they're not very salt tolerant. In the wintertime, I don't know about you, this is my first time living up in Minnesota last winter, um, but I can imagine if it's anything like where I live down in St. Paul, is you know, our banks, our boulevards, and our parkways and medians get destroyed in the winter, after, the, after the winter coming into the spring uh, just because of all the salt damage and all the, you know, stuff from plows and, and salt trucks and, and uh, winter vehicles and everything. And so what we think, one thing that we've been doing uh, is we've been researching uh, roadside turf. And you can you know, read more about that on our website. Uh, but this is one thing that they did a few years ago, looking at uh, fine fescues, not only for their you know, low inputs, but also for their salt tolerance uh, on roadsides, on, on, on uh, parkways and in the boulevards, and this is right in front of the governor's mansion uh, down there in St. Paul. So another way that we evaluate grasses in terms of their drought tolerance, you know, this is how we help, trying to help you know, give a behind the curtain look at you know, how, how do I know or how can you see how we determine uh, you know, which grasses are drought tolerant? Which ones should you as a consumer, as a homeowner, or the property manager be utilizing? A lot of universities uh, will have some type of shelter, um, what we commonly refer to as a rainout shelter or a rainout structure. We can evaluate grasses in a natural environment, so it's not inside a greenhouse, it's not inside a, a growth chamber, it's actually out in the field where it's exposed to all the elements uh, that you know, grass like your, lawn, like your lawn would have or in a park or, or you know, on a roadside would, would have. And then if it's raining out, we have a shelter in this case it's, it's not a fixed roof, it's a mobile roof rainout shelter. So uh, whenever it rains, um, let's say it starts raining, that shelter will move, oh, let me go back. that shelter will move over that area. 
it has a rain sensor affixed to top of it, and it will automatically move and prevent those plots uh, from getting any rain on them. And so over time, um, we can start to see some separation uh, during the summer in terms of which varieties or which species do well uh, with no water from irrigation and no water uh, from rainfall as well. You can see there, you know, especially that photo on the left really highlights the, the differences in, in among uh, the species, but then on the photo on the right, you know, there's only maybe about two or three uh, treatments or species there or, or cultivars that have done well and still maintain their green cover. I think you, we normally run these for about you know, 60 days or so, so this may be on day 60 there. Again, it really helps us identify, you know, if we were not to have any uh, rainfall at all and didn't have any irrigation, you know, which variety or which species would maintain their green cover the longest. Again, just some more photos. This is from a different trial, but similar uh, you know, type of system uh, with the rain out shelter uh, just moving over and we can just see it. it's we can go to that plot and we can look up in our plot plan which variety that was and then we can submit that data we can publish it we can come back to you know White Bear Lake City Hall and share that information with you guys or put it on our website and we put a lot of our data uh, from a lot of our trials on there uh, usually after the trial is done which is about two or three year periods. So how much water do lawns require? Well it really depends on your expectations. You know, we talked about all these different grasses and all these different protocols, but you know, maybe does our grass have to look like Augusta National, or I guess in, up here in Minnesota, Hazeltine National Golf Club? Does it have to look like um, Target Field? Uh, I would say no, it doesn't. You know, a little brown is actually a little bit good. It's not necessarily bad. Um, if you think about it, though, we are not farmers. We may be called urban farmers, but we're not producing a yield. We're not feeding the world with this grass. So how do we quantify how much water is required? You know, how much farmers, they're quantifying the water requirement based upon their yield or production horticulture. They have to produce a product uh, to put on the shelf at, at garden centers. And so as turf grass scientists and as homeowners, you know, we do this in terms of the performance, in terms of recreation, in terms of maybe if we have pets or kids, um, if we want to host parties at our, in our lawn outside. And just the overall quality and look to that lawn as it surrounds and as it, as it borders our, our property. Um, <clears throat> so it's basically the total amount of water that's utilized for plant growth and development um, and to keep that lawn be as healthy as we can be. The way that we estimate this is the water that's lost through evaporation and transpiration from the soil and the plant surfaces. So these are big two words that maybe you've heard of before, uh, particularly evaporation. We learned about that in probably third grade science class, but transpiration, all that is, is just plant sweat. You know, you and I, we sweat, and we call that perspiration. Plants lose water through their leaves, through their surfaces, on, the, on their leaves, and it's called transpiration. They have little tiny pores uh, called stomata, and that's where the water comes out of. So uh, we, that's how plants lose water, and we are able to figure out how much water is then required based upon the water that's been lost. And so these environmental conditions are things that influence the water that's lost through evaporation and the water that's lost through transpiration. And so if you think about you know, yourselves as humans, when it's hot outside, uh, when, it, when it's hot outside, we start sweating. Uh, we start getting tired. We just want to hang out. We don't want a bunch of people you know, hitting us or you know, walking all over us or anything. Of course, nobody would hopefully do that. But if you think about it from the plant's perspective, you know, when it's hot outside, they just want to hang out too. They're sweating too. They just want people to lay off of them. They don't want to be mowed down to, you know, back down to two inches. They don't want to be, you know, fertilized and having. Imagine if somebody came up to you in the heat of the summer and just started stuffing a bunch of vitamins down your throat. And that's what happens when we start fertilizing, uh, you know, throughout the summertime. Remember that life cycle chart that we had it's on the back of your sheet there? You know, they just are trying to survive during the summertime. Uh, you don't need to be out there fertilizing uh, then because when we do that, then we have to water to help you know, balance out that, that nutrient overloading. Um, so irrigation should match uh, evapotranspiration. That's the combination of those two words. VT is just an easy way to remember it. The combined loss of water through, through the soil and through the plants. And so as I mentioned, you know, all these weather things that go into to influencing the water requirements, so just sunlight, temperature, all the things that affect you and me as well, wind, humidity, and rainfall. 
So this is ZT. So this is it. So if you're really interested in knowing what it is, on that manual on the right is all the science and mathematics behind it. Now I have my PhD, but I'll tell you, I somehow got away with not having to take calculus. And even if I did, I don't think I would know what this formula is. In fact, my reaction to this formula is this. I don't know anything other than that certain sections of that. Each one of those sections on that formula, one of them represents sunlight, one of them represents wind, one of them represents humidity, all those other things that go into it. But luckily, you and I, you know, we don't have to have calculus, we don't have to have a degree in meteorology or, or any of the other math that's involved in that. We can just utilize weather station data and it'll quantify ET for us. Now this is one that you'd see at a university research station. This is really big, uh, probably not something that you would have here in White Bear Lake or you know, even um, in a home or in a neighborhood, a park and rec area. Uh, this is something you'd see like at a NOAA weather station or a university research station. Very expensive, not a lot of stuff to it. Most of us you know, download it on a computer and everything. But nowadays, as technology has come along, you know, you can get a personal weather station for under $200 for your home. You could have one right here at White Bay Lake City Hall, uh, and homeowners in the area could connect to it and, and look at, you know, the weather data. There's a lot of calculators online, ET calculators, where you can provide those inputs of, you know, wind, of temperature, of humidity, of rainfall, and then it'll provide you that ET number. The ET number is just basically, you know, the amount of water that's lost, usually in inches or millimeters of water. As we talked about, you know, the last time I was here, you know, we try to apply our irrigation in terms of not in a runtime, but in a volume. You know, if you ask me, well, how long, you know, how long should I run my irrigation system for? Well, I'm never going to tell you you should run your irrigation system for 20 minutes. I'm going to tell you a volume amount of irrigation. I'll probably ask you, well, what was your ET? Or what's, what's your local weather been like the past few days? Then I'm able to provide you an estimate, usually a volume amount, just like ET, and you'll replace, you know, you'll usually replace you know, right at ET or a little bit below ET, which is what a lot of smart irrigation technologies do. They reduce below, they apply water in less than amounts, uh, in, in less than what was, lo was lost through ET. And they do that by com communicating with these weather stations. So this is just an example of, you know, some, an ET trial uh, and a rain out shelter. And what we did, this is at the University of Arkansas, uh, we're able to utilize basically a, a camera on top of a box, and inside that box are four light bulbs. It's a constant light source. And so we try to eliminate, eliminate any bias. So instead of me walking around and saying this one's good and this one's bad, and I'm going to ask the volunteer, what's your name? Eduardo. Eduardo? So I may say a bluegrass is really good, and Eduardo may come and say, no, it's really bad, or vice versa. You know, we try to eliminate any bias. And so we utilize this light box, this little blue box, and it has a camera on top, the light bulb's underneath, and we're able to go over top of every single one of those plots and take a photograph, just like you would, you know, if you were to stand out in your, your yard. And then this is what it looks like online. And then we'll run it through a software program. And again, this is, a, this is for basically any trial that we do now. Uh, almost every single trial that we have, whether it's a water requirement, drought trial, or if it's just a regular quality trial or something to do with diseases, we're able to take these images, these above ground images, and then you know, run them through a software analyzer or an image analyzer, and it can tell us the amount of green. They just basically count the pixels really fast, like within like less than two minutes, and then tell us which ones are more green and which ones aren't. So on the top in this photo here, uh, we have Kentucky bluegrass, which is, uh, and on the bottom we have Kentucky bluegrass as well. This is what we were talking about earlier in terms of turf grass selection, selecting drought tolerant cultivars or drought resistant cultivars. On the top, mallard is very drought resistant or very drought tolerant, whereas snap on the, on the bottom uh, is not. It, it is very drought sensitive. It's not drought tolerant. So we looked at irrigating these, these two species, these two species of bluegrasses, mallard and snap, at different amounts of ET. You know, we replaced 48% or 40 or 32% of water that was lost uh, through the weather conditions, basically. And you can see, you know, above and below just the differences. And again, everything was managed the same. These are just two different cultivars. This is the importance, as Nick asked me to talk about. We'll talk about fescues here in a second, but 
you know, choosing the right variety, whether it's bluegrass, whether it's fescue, um, can go a long way. We could see at the 32% ET replacement, you know, mallard still looks fairly good as opposed to the snap at 32% ET replacement. You know, it's pretty brown at that point. And so if we think about our grasses, we spent a lot of time looking behind the scenes of the research protocols and, you know, all these things that go into, you know, these things that we're going to talk about, how do you know, you know, these grasses are what I say they are? In terms or what you read in textbooks or online on our website. Well, it's because of all these tests and all these protocols uh, that myself and my colleagues and the researchers and scientists that have come before me have done and that we continue to do. And so as we talk about these, just think about, you know, these are how we've identified these um, over time. So we'll talk about four species today. We've already talked about, um, you've already seen this slide, but these are the four that we'll talk about uh, tonight. So tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, um, fine fescues and um, perennial eyegrass. I forgot to take those arrows out of there, pardon me. Um, so you can skip ahead. So let's think about these in terms of just their overall, uh, you know, maintenance requirements and their overall just performance in general. Some traits or some pros and cons to them. So turf grasses, as we talked about earlier, uh, we don't have a production unit. We do not have a yield outside of seed production, we do not have a yield to measure them by or to, to, to rank them by. And so we utilize a scale uh, in which we evaluate them according to turf grass quality. Again, going back to that NTEP trial, uh, usually on a one to nine scale. I wasn't there when they made that up. I don't know why it didn't go up to 10. I don't know why it starts at one. Uh, but either way, most NTEP trials go on a one to nine scale. And usually anything above a, a six or above is usually uh, pretty good in terms of or being acceptable quality. And so just overall quality, you know, for the most part, the highest quality you'll have is typically in Kentucky bluegrass or perennial ryegrass. Now those are what you also see, you know, at football stadiums or, or at the Twins game, or at, the, at the Twins field, at Target field, in baseball stadiums. Again, very high maintenance uh, situations, you know, think about all the money that goes into sports. You know, they have the money to mow it every day, to fertilize it, to nurse it, uh, to reseed if they have to right away. Whereas in a home lawn, you know, um, we don't have that opportunity. Now, I know this is, this is a little bit misleading, the fact that, you know, fine fescues and tall fescues are low, but, you know, they're not poor quality grasses. They just have, overall, if we were to put all the inputs we could into all four of these, which, one would look, which ones would look the best? You know, probably Kentucky bluegrass or perennial ryegrass. Those are the ones that you also see that, that stripe really well. Tall fescue and fine fescue, they don't really stripe at all. Um, they don't have that characteristics on their leaves. Wear resistance. So let's say how many of you have pets or children or grandchildren or just like to be outside and, and recreate on your lawn? So tall fescue, perennial ryegrass, uh, Kentucky bluegrass, they're all, they're, those are three that are really good at wear and really good at traffic. Now, of course, if you have a dog, you know, over time, if they go in the same spot over and over again, and I'm talking about traffic, not necessarily dog urine, but dog, you know, running around or pets, um, it can, it doesn't matter how tolerant it is, if continued wear in that, in that same spot, uh, you know, the turf will, will get beat up. But fine fescues, one thing, if there are some criticisms about fine fescue, it is that they're not very wear tolerant. They're not very good with traffic, with repeated traffic. That's one reason why we say you don't need to mow them in the summer because they don't like to have a lot of you know, heavy equipment on them and a lot of traffic on them during that time. Not only do they not grow very fast, but you know, when we do put that undue pressure on them, uh, it doesn't perform very well. Uh, recuperative ability. So what happens when they, are, when they do get injured? Or what happens when you know, we maybe do scalp it or something? Uh, well, Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, um, they recover pretty well. They're both very, uh, have different drought resistance mechanisms uh, to them that allow them to, you know, look for water, um, you know, or, or, you know, conserve their resources to recover upon rainfall or irrigation. Uh, perennial ryegrass uh, doesn't really recover very well. And fine fescue, again, it's kind of similar to wear tolerance. Um, it's just, you know, it's very slow growing, doesn't grow very fast. And so if we do have any damage, it's going to take a little bit. Establishment. The reason why we have perennial ryegrass here in Minnesota and other places, and you know, Minnesota up north, we have a lot of perennial ryegrass seed production going on, is because it is a quick establisher. I'm talking maybe two or three days, you'll start to see some germination. If you go to the box stores like Lowe's, Home Depot, Menards, 
you'll see a lot of packages that have ryegrass in them because you know a homeowner would go buy that and they think, man, this product works. I see, this, I bought this on Tuesday and it's already popping on Friday morning. Uh, but it it it's a little bit of a false hope if you're looking for low input lawns because it requires a lot more uh, after establishment, a lot more water and inputs. Uh, Kentucky Blue Tall Fest can find fescue about you know seven to ten days. It really just depends on the time of the year and the temperature uh, and the water. And then Kentucky Bluegrass somewhere between ten and fourteen days, so about two weeks. Uh, but in terms of what we're you're probably interested in and what you know uh, Vlamo v- v- is, is interested in is the overall you know water requirements and the drought tolerance. And this is where uh, we're talking about in terms of low input lawns. And he talked about, Nick co- talked about the cost share program. Uh, tall fescue and fine fescue are so much more drought tolerant and drought resistant than these other grasses. Kentucky bluegrasses, they're getting better. Uh, there are, as we talked about, that example of mallard. Uh, you know, we're irrigating that at 32% ET replacement. Um, there are some, you know, improved varieties of Kentucky bluegrass that will do well. They won't do well in the shade, so just think about it. It's not, it may not be a drought issue. It may be a shade issue that you have. Um, but there are some that, that will do be- better than some of our older varieties. Perennial ryegrass, though, not very drought tolerant. And then shade tolerance, uh, fine fescue, tall fescue, uh, much more so than the bluegrass and the ryegrass. Uh, disease resistance, um, tall fescue and fine fescue, also pretty disease resistant up here in Minnesota. We don't really have a lot of diseases. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass and perennial ryegrass, we do have some diseases, especially uh, in cool, humid areas and, and kind of some prolonged wet times. Uh, have any of you walked through your lawn and you see a bunch of orange and get a bunch of orange on your shoes? That's, that's rust, uh, which is what we see a lot on, on ryegrass and on bluegrass. So it doesn't really kill your grass, but it just makes a mess. It's very cosmetic. And then also up here in Minnesota, one thing we think about is winter hardiness. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass, fine fescue, pretty winter hardy. Tall fescue, it really doesn't do well under prolonged ice cover. Um, so in a low lying area. One thing we recommend though is using a mixture. You know, you don't just have to use, you know, Kentucky bluegrass. You don't just have to use fine fescue. You can definitely mix these and we'll talk about that here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, perennial ryegrass, not very winter hardy. So what type of lawn do you desire? The photo on the left is on campus um, and the photo on the right is on campus as well. There's two different photos, two different scenarios uh, and also two different grasses. We have high input blue, Kentucky bluegrass and lower inputs, uh, fine fescue, growing you know, in the shade. It's got the prostrate habit. It's kind of hard to tell from the time of the day that photo was taken, but that grass is pretty green when you stand up uh, pretty close to it. So Nick had asked me and invited me to talk about some low input lawns, and we'll spend the rest of the few minutes that we have remaining to talk about those. And so to think about you know, low input lawn care, there's three things we have to keep in mind, and we'll talk about one of them primarily tonight. Uh, choosing the right grass, choosing the right turf. And then also, you know, what are we doing underground? You know, a lot of times our homes here in the Twin Cities area and homes, they're built on really bad soil. And so, you know, understanding our rooting depth and our, and our, and our uh, soil structure underneath, our soil texture, whether you have a sand or clays or homey soil, you know, what we can do in terms of improving our soils through uh, airification practices and other cultivations, whether it's deep tining or dethatching or using a power rake or some sort to kind of help uh, increase our rooting and increase our water and nutrient infiltration uh, deeper in the soil. And then lastly, just doing our basic uh, proper, you know, best management practices, proper mowing, proper fertilization, all the things that you can find on our extension website, a lot of the things that are on the back of that handout that you have with you tonight. And so as we've talked about, you know, as we go along and as you think about, you're going to the store, and you're wanting to find some fine fescue. You're wanting to find some tall fescue. On the back of the bag, you'll see you know, the fine fescue, the tall fescue. You'll see a name usually after that as well. Um, and if you're reading in the literature, you know, in a textbook or in an article or something maybe on our website, you'll see some other names that kind of look funny. They're Latin. So it's a scientific name or the taxonomic name. So just to use Kentucky bluegrass as an example, that's the common name. But if you were to go overseas, let's say you go to Europe, to the Plaza Mayor, and you say Kentucky bluegrass, they may look at you funny because they may not call it that there. Um, where I came from in Arkansas, we called, and when I lived in Kentucky, we called Creeping Charlie, we called it Ground Ivy. I got up here and everybody calls it Creeping Charlie. Uh, but nobody calls it Glencoma heteroroma, which is a scientific name. Uh, but again, that's the same thing with grasses as well. 
not only with weeds but grasses. They have scientific, they have taxonomic or, or Latin names. But the variety, what you'll see on the back of a, of a bag, uh, in terms of what, what's listed there, and you can go online and you know, find that data through the NTAP or through other trials. Uh, that photo that I showed a view of the, of the bag and, and the lows, it had all those varieties of perennial ryegrass mentioned. In this case, the variety is midnight Kentucky bluegrass. So we've talked a lot about Kentucky bluegrass. We've talked a lot about these already. We'll kind of skip through these really quickly, uh, but just some of the pros and the cons. It's the more widely used grass here in Minnesota because it is available as, as seed, but also because of its availability as sod. Uh, it forms really good sides. A lot of people like to install uh, places, uh, do establishments really quickly. And so, you know, in that case, you can do, utilize sod in those installations. There's a lot of cons to it as well, but for the sake of time, you know, I'll skip through these. This will be online. Um, and we've already talked about a few of these already. Um, one thing, though, just real quick, is the summer dormancy. Uh, that's not necessarily a negative thing in terms of plant health. That's actually a, gro a growth, you know, response where it'll turn brown but the growing points are still alive. They're doing all they can. So they stop you know, using energy to maintain their greenness. They use their energy to you know, keep those growing points alive. But a lot of folks you know, in the summertime, they don't want their lawn to be brown. They don't want that lawn to be dormant. So that could be a con in that instance. Perennial ryegrass, we talked about this just a second ago. Uh, it is used because it's quick establishment. Um, if you're doing a new construction project, um, or a new project and you're trying to reestablish that bare spot, uh, you probably have some perennial ryegrass in that, in that patch repair mix or in that mixture. Um, endophyte infection, you don't need to worry about that. It's just basically a, a natural organism in the plant that kind of helps it uh, with any type of environmental stress. We've talked about some of the cons earlier. Annual ryegrass, just real quickly, this is something that you need to watch out for. What's the problem with annual ryegrass? What would be a problem that you think would be with annual ryegrass? It's, it's kind of stiff. Don't think too hard about it. Annual ryegrass. It's an, it's an annual. It's an annual. So why would you buy this uh, and have to replant it every year? But this is sold in a lot of seed mixes, if, especially if you go uh, off a box store. So just make sure you read the label uh, on there um, with that. And... Uh, um, you see this a lot in patch repair mixes as well, so just be careful, be aware of that. So but let's transition, though, from those high-maintenance turfs to low-input uh, grasses. So these are some different characteristics, you know, depending on what we're aiming for in terms of our inputs. And some of these may have, you know, incorporate all five or six of these uh, in terms of their input, in terms of their low-input attributes. So there's different characteristics that we can use to evaluate the inputs uh, that are required. So tall fescue, we've talked about this uh, a little bit at length already tonight, um, but you know it's utilized in lawns. We see it some in athletic fields and in taller mode areas and on a golf course, maybe in roughs, uh, in parks and recreation areas. Very drought tolerant, very shade tolerant, very wear tolerant. Uh, not a lot of diseases here in Minnesota. Again, not very winter hardy under ice cover. You can always reseed it um, in the fall. Um, but one thing to also think about too, a lot of people don't like how wide it is compared to maybe Kentucky bluegrass. But if you look at the sample that we have tonight, you know, it's really not that too big of a difference. And you can also mix it in. Uh, we encourage folks to use mixtures of bluegrass and fescue. Um, we're not going to go and talk a little bit about the history. You can read that on your own time. But, you know, it has been around. We originally were feeding it to our livestock. And now since then, we've, we've developed turf-type varieties, uh, which are more, you know, finer and compact and more slow, uh, low-growing than the forage varieties. So fine fescues, we've talked about, we've been talking about those. When I say fine fescues though, we're talking about uh, about four or five different species of, of fine fescues that all in of themselves have different attributes um, in terms of, of how they grow, their characteristics. So this is kind of what they look like. This is them as a mixture in terms of when they've been mowed, you see the mowing pattern, but also when they've not been mowed and their seed heads. Um, you can see just the difference there. And again, just a very nice picture, very nice uh, area in term there on our campus. And so why, are we, why have we been studying this? Why did Nick ask me to come up here and, and share some of the stuff out of our program? Well, um, you know, less inputs. But also, you know, the government may, may come a time where we have 
you know, stricter laws. We already have some fertilizer laws in terms of our phosphorus. They talked about phosphorus. You know, you're not allowed to apply any fertilizer with a phosphorus in the state of Minnesota unless it's a new establishment or unless uh, you have a soil test indicating you're low in phosphorus. Uh, but also just, you know, that's, we've talked to you guys and we've done the research and, and consumers have shown that they don't want to have to mow. They don't want to have to fertilize. They don't want to have to water. And they're also just be, you know, just thinking ahead for our future in terms of, you know, what we, we may be in for. It's, but as I mentioned before, you know, it's not just, you know, as, as uh, high mow or, or low mow or no mow turf grasses. You know, there's been some testing done looking at it in fairway and punting green height as well. But this is an example on a golf course in a no mow area. You know, these non-playable areas. We got to be golfers in the room here tonight, a few. Um, you know, I, that's probably where I would hit my ball is in that no mow area. So I'm, I'm not very good at golf. But uh, I enjoy it, but I don't know why because I'm not good at it. But, but you know, this is your, you think about, you know, people point fingers at golf courses for, you know, golf courses are one of the more sustainable and, and responsible people on earth because they have a budget to maintain and labor and time to maintain. Um, but, you know, they're trying to reduce the amount of area they have to manage and they'll put in these low maintenance grasses. You see grasses like this again, and I think Nick was kind of talking about this on roadsides so or on stream banks, on areas that, you know, we don't want somebody to have to go and mow every, you know, week or so. And we want something that's kind of high that will help, you know, recharge the groundwater, provide a perennial cover there. It would be an excellent choice uh, for areas around like White Bear Lake and other uh, areas and water bodies. And then on roadside, so this isn't a fine fescue here, this is Kentucky bluegrass, this is what we normally have on roadsides. And I have a graduate student, we have a graduate student uh, colleague who in our program that is continuing our roadside research with the Minnesota Department of Transportation, uh, looking at fine fescues for roadsides, as I showed in that photo earlier at the governor's mansion, well, he's doing his research on establishment, uh, looking at how much water is required, what's the maintenance factors in terms of water, or, you know, varieties or uh, of fine fescues uh, to utilize, or species of fine fescues to utilize on roadsides. And so we talked about fine fescues. They do well in shade. They do well in the sun. Very slow growing. There's two main types of fine fescues. There's bunch type, which basically they just grow in one central spot. They'll have tillers kind of pop out of them from on the sides. And then we have rhizomatous, which is just like Kentucky bluegrass, where you have those underground stems. You know, you have some Kentucky bluegrass where you seeded it, then you'll notice it grows in other parts of your yard as well because of those underground lateral stems. And so these are the fescues that I talked about. Again, fine fescues is just the general overall term. It's there on your sheet. But then you, if you were to go to a store or if you go to a, a co-op or, or um, a seed company and, get, and ask for some fine fescues, they would probably ask you which one you want. And so these are the five different uh, species that, that we have uh, when we talk about these. Strong Keeping Red, Slender Creeping Red, and Chewing's Fescue all belong to a red fescue family. Whereas hard fescue and sheep fescue are two other uh, different species entirely. And so our bunch type fescues are hard and chewing's fescue and sheep fescue. So, and those, they're, again, these are all very similar in terms of like their performance, but you know, they, they grow a little bit differently. They're more of the bunch type habit. And then our rhizomatous ones are our creeping fescues, our slender creeping red and our strong creeping red. And what we recommend is that you utilize a mixture of these uh, five grasses when, you, when you're considering switching over to a fine fescue, low input lawn. Um, and again, this is just a photo demonstrating the winter hardiness. Um, throughout, around the plots, you have some rye grasses. Inside the plot, that one green plot is fine fescue. Um, but I talked about using a, using a mixture of fine fescue species. And again, this is that same location that I keep on showing you uh, there on campus. I'm talking about our, our, our just, you know, only mowing once in the year, uh, right now, basically, or in a few weeks from now. The reason why is because we don't want a bunch of snow just laying on top of the, those leaves and just creating a bunch of leaf wetness uh, during the winter period. We want to kind of uh, get that snow down into the canopy of the soil, uh, down into the root zone. Um, as that sun comes out and helps it melt. And so which fine fescue mixture should you utilize if you're switching over? Um, well, if you have more sun than shade, again, thinking about these as both being sun and shade tolerant, you know, we have some recommendations here. Uh, more hard and fescue predominantly in more sunny areas, but if you have more shade than sun, then use more chewings and less hard. About strong creeper red fescue is about 20% um, either or. So again, uh, this will be online, so we're going to uh, skip on to the next slide here. There are some non-traditional turf grass species 
uh, that are native to North America. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, and because a lot of people say, I want something that's native. You know, just because turf, the turf grasses that we've talked about, they're not necessarily native, they're not invasive either. They've become naturalized. Uh, they're not, you know, going to take over like kudzu or, or ground ivy or anything like that. Um, but we do have some native uh, grasses here to North America, but they're not traditionally used in a home lawn. Uh, they haven't really been heavily researched for their traffic tolerance. It's very hard to get seed for them in terms of seed production or finding somebody that produces these and sells these. And so, and there's also, uh, you know, lower density grasses. They're kind of more like ornamental grasses and not something that you would have in your lawn as a dense ground cover. So I want to end tonight just really quickly. I know we're probably out of time, but just really quickly leave you a few slides. As you think about uh, converting over to a fine fescue lawn or a tall fescue lawn, or even a Kentucky bluegrass that's more drought tolerant um, with a drought resistant cultivar, uh, just thinking about purchasing grass seed. So we have a lot of seed production here in Minnesota. Um, you know, up north, uh, most of our seed in the United States is produced in the Willamette Valley in Oregon and in the Pacific Northwest area. We do have some in the Dakotas and also in the northern parts of, the, of Minnesota uh, at, at some of the research stations up there. So when you look at a bag of seed, you'll see either a blue, you'll see a blue tag and it will have information on it. We'll talk about what's on that tag here in a second. Uh, but you know, think about all this stuff that's regulated uh, by the federal government. You know, just like any other crop, you know, your turf grass seed, that seed that you put in your lawn, it has to be certified. That's why it's important that we recommend you buy certified seed and not something out of a seed bin or a bulk bin at a co-op or at a, at a garden center. You know, make sure you're buying, you know what you're buying and that label is on there. Uh, also, the same thing for uh, gold tags as well, sod quality seed, uh, which has even less tolerance for weeds. Um, these cost for a lot. You know, only homeowners wouldn't buy these and they're not very widely available as well. Um, this would be more for uh, a high maintenance facility like a sports field or a golf course. Um, one thing to keep in mind though is that, you know, if you want the best, just like steak, if you want the best, you don't have to expay, expect to pay a higher cost. But it's definitely worth it, just like that steak is, right? Uh, or, you know, if you're vegetarian, I, I don't know, a cauliflower. I have a friend, best friend who's vegetarian. She's always talking about the cauliflower that she eats. So I, I don't remember eating cauliflower. I probably haven't eaten cauliflower since I was like six. So. Uh, we can go on the next slide. So on a seed label, so this is required by law to have all of these things. Uh, if you pick up a label and it doesn't have um, these things, then you should probably not buy that product. Um, but the seed company, the seed lot number, uh, we had an issue in our research uh, program earlier this year that we had just gotten some seed directly from um, the producer. We didn't go through uh, and buy it off a store, but we had an issue and we contacted them and said, hey, you know, we saw this weed seed pop up and we just used the seed lot number to help them get back to their research farm to figure out, because they were out in Oregon and they were able to figure out what was going on. Um, but that, it's, it's why that information is there so you can figure out, you know, if there are any issues, what lot that came out of from that company. Uh, variety or VNS, which is variety not stated. And then percent purity, you know, how many of those seeds are, are, are actual turf grass seeds, the germination, um, Percentage or rate of those seeds, um, the weed seeds or other crops that may be in there, any inert matter like packaging material, um, any weeds, and also the date of germination test is on there as well. So these are some standards of all the things that we just talked about. Uh, but for time's sake, we'll skip this slide uh, and go on to uh, just mixing and blending. So I've talked a little bit about mixtures or blends. So a mixture is uh, mixing two or more species, so a bluegrass and a fescue or a bluegrass and uh, ryegrass, or a tall fescue and a ryegrass, or even a tall fescue and a fine fescue. Those are two different species. Um, a blend is two or more cultivars of the same species. So, you know, four different uh, tall fescues or three different Kentucky bluegrasses, for instance. And the reason why is because, you know, some of them have improved tolerance. Maybe there's a heat tolerant tall fescue and a drought tolerant tall fescue. There's a salt tolerant fine fescue and a shade, uh, very drought tolerant uh, fine fescue as well. So it's, there's not a, the problem is there's not a lot of good data at this time. There hasn't really been a lot of research looking at mixtures because it's very hard to uh, quantify once it's established how much of those species are in that mixture. But that data is coming. There's been some trials that have just been started within the last years or so. Uh, so this is just an example of what you see on a seed label um, on the back of it. You know, this is what you see. I see this a lot in stores now. Uh, Midwest mix, so here for this region. North Central Region, uh, Scott's product, 
And again, it just has the varieties listed there, or the species, and then the cultivar, the varieties listed there, uh, and then the percent of seed by weight in that bag. So one thing to think about is it also has a super absorbent coating, it says on it. Uh, you want to kind of be careful with that. I don't know if I have a slide on that. We'll keep on going, and we'll talk a little bit more about it in a second. Uh, tall fescue, this is an example of a blend. So all of these are all tall fescues. Um, and the percent by weight there, and then you have the cultivar there on, on the, on the left-hand column. Uh, this is an example of a low-grow NOMO mixture, uh, Best Winters low-grow mixture. Now you see VNS. That's that variety not stated. VNS. Uh, that's something you want to stay away from or just be careful with because that means the variety has not been stated. So, you know, you have no clue whether that's a good cultivar or a bad cultivar, or a good variety or a bad variety. You see some annual ryegrass in that mixture. Now, probably not a good product to use. Probably not a product of choice if there's other uh, better products around that don't have any annual ryegrass in them. So just keep that in mind, because, you know, the first thing that'll pop up in that mixture is that annual ryegrass. So just bear that in mind. Um, coated seeds, so I did talk about this. So just one thing to think about is, you know, there's a lot of seed coatings out there. A lot of these are just mainly used for handling purposes to make it a little bit easier uh, to distribute out of the hopper, or out, of the, out of the carrier, out from your hand. Uh, some of the times they have some nutrients or some fungicides on them or they help to retain moisture, but for the most part it's just a handling thing. Um, but think about, you know, seed by weight, how it's sold, you know, this makes up a lot of the weight in the seed, in, the, in that product. So just, you probably don't have to have coated seed and you'll be just fine um, without, in terms of establishing your lawn. So again, thinking about you get what you pay for. Um, even though a small increase in cost, just like that steak, it'll definitely um, pay off in the long run. And then make sure you're paying for grass seed. Don't pay for you know, a bunch of weed seed, a bunch of noxious weeds, a bunch of you know, filler material like mulch or you know, seed coatings and so forth. Um, Avoid the VNS, avoid the variety not stated. And then avoid some var bad varieties. There's some older varieties of perennial ryegrass or some tall fescues. Kentucky 31 is a forage type fescue that you would feed to your livestock. Um, avoid some annual the ryegrasses as well. So where to purchase stripgrass seed? We can end on this slide tonight. Um, there's some other stuff uh, in here, but I think this is the last slide that's, that's important. Um, you can go online and and on our website, we have a list of local seed suppliers. Turf.umn.edu, uh, purchasing turf grass seed. Um, we have a list of professional distributors. And also, you can just go online sometimes. You never know. Uh, and just make sure you, you know, do your homework and, and connect uh, with the people you're buying the seeds from if you do choose to do it online. And ask them some of the questions that you've learned about tonight. Uh, local garden centers, farmers co-ops uh, usually are pretty good choices as well. Uh, I would encourage you to probably not go to Menards or Home Depot or Lowe's, a box store. Uh, you know, go there for something else that's not grass seed. Maybe they have, you know, some weed eater string or maybe they have a, something that you need for, like, your lawn equipment. But don't try not to go for your, for your grass seed if, if you can uh, just because um, they may not have the best seed or they may have something that has a lot of other seeds in there that you don't want um, or just in terms of just the overall cost per product of what you pay for, you may have a better opportunity to get that at one of these local distributors here or these garden centers. Um, we'll skip ahead just one more slide. Um, these are some summary points that um, we've talked about earlier tonight. And skip ahead, I think, to the next one. All right, so any other questions I didn't answer tonight? And I'll stick around for a few minutes afterwards if you have questions you want to talk to me about. But go online on our extension website. You know, we didn't really talk about how to seed or when to seed or, you know, other things to think about. It's all online on our Turfgrass Extension website. If you go to extension.umn.edu, there's a yard and garden section, and all of that information is on there as well.